Welcome back, and it is just after 11 o'clock. I'm so excited. Today, we're doing Inside Hollywood a little bit early, but uh, it's for a wonderful guest, and without any further ado, your host, our favorite producer, Hawk Koch. Thanks, Jen. Appreciate it, and uh, I hope I don't get too emotional today because uh, I get to be interviewing one of my heroes, and mentors, Robert Benton. Uh, for those of you who may not know Robert Benton, and I don't think there's anybody in the industry that doesn't, he's won 25 different awards, including directing, writing, and a few uh, Lifetime Achievement Awards. Uh, he's won three Oscars for directing Kramer versus Kramer and for writing Kramer and Places in the Heart. He was nominated for three other Oscars for writing uh, a little film called Bonnie and Clyde, the Late Show, and Nobody's Fool. Among his other credits are one of my favorite uh, Barbara Streisand movies, What's Up, Doc, and the Christopher Reeves Superman. Or should I say, yeah, the Christopher Reeves Superman. He directed eight different actors to uh, best acting nominations at the Academy, three of whom won. He has two families, his amazing artist wife, Sally, of over 50 years, and his great son, John, and his movie family, which we will talk about because I know he feels about his movie family the same way I feel, and you've heard me talk about my, my movie family. I don't know anyone who knows more about movies than Robert, and we'll find out why. He is, in my opinion, the cinephile's cinephile. Again, I'm proud to welcome my friend, Robert Benton. Come on in, Bob. There he is. Thank you all very much. And I'd like to start on a personal note with Hawk. I just saw a lovely photograph of your sister with, with Merle Miller. Oh, and wow. Great. And they both look terrific. And I was so thrilled uh, to have that photograph from, from Merle of, of, you know, of your sister. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I was up there that day. I think I took that photo, actually. Oh, really? Well, you're yeah. very good. Great. So let's get back into, let's let's start at the beginning, Bob. You, you, I know you were born in, in Dallas, but you you grew up in Waxahachie, Texas, which I, I was lucky enough to, to, yes. to visit we with you on a local many years ago. And you told a story about, I think your great-grandfather was the... Sheriff of Waxahachie? My great grandfather was the sheriff of Waxahachie for about three weeks before he got shot. And uh, that's just to give you an idea of the success rate in my family. And uh, it was um, a small town, and I grew up with a series of um, stories. We didn't have history, but we had stories. And they included a lot of sort of um, semi-nefarious deeds. I mean, a number of of my relatives uh, either were shot or shot people, and it was it was um, it was an interesting family to come from, and it was a, it sort of gave me honor, you want to call it that, for a lot of the work that that I've done throughout my life. Well, um, I understand, and you and I talked about this a long time ago, although I can't understand it, but as a, as a kid, you were severely dyslexic. And I was very dyslexic. I was also very nearsighted, and nobody in my family thought to get me glasses until I was about 18. <laughs> So we were we were a kind of uh, loosely run family. 
and it was when I when I put on glasses for the first time and things came into focus. It was it was extraordinarily exciting, and I, my life changed at that moment. You know? Revelatory. Absolutely right. Well, now, but but instead, but instead of being able to read and write, I understood. You, but you could draw, right? Yeah, I I couldn't maintain concentration reading, and certainly not writing. But I could maintain concentration uh, drawing, and so I it was it's dyslexia. It's a form of dyslexia, <laughs> and so. Uh, while I couldn't read, I would sit and draw and draw and draw, and and it carried me through a lot of sort of in in different teachers who sometimes absolutely loathed me, and um, but somehow I managed to get get through it, and slowly I figured strategies to to fade reading. And and I developed, I became adroit at lying to say yes I've done it and I could you know I would invent things and I, in that sense that was when I became a, a writer at least a screenwriter because lying in lying you have to be very creative about what you lie about and so it's a form of writing I was an underappreciated form of writing but it's a form of writing. Well, now, what were you were you drawing stories? What what were you drawing? I would draw. It was during World War II, and I think I destroyed more Japanese fighters than the entire than they could faster than they could make them. Okay. <laughs> and finally, I gave. I read it was uh, fruitless. They, I would keep destroying these Japanese heroes, and they kept putting them out there for. Uh, <laughs> And finally, somebody found an art school, and I found out that drawing a paint wasn't just drawing an object. It had to do with drawing an object in relationship to the frame and to a background and a foreground. And it was um, that time changed my life. I I I, I became. I was never a very good artist, but I came a became a devoted artist at that point. And I went to, I graduated from high school at the, at the lowest level you could you could be and move on, on and that, that you could be still be allowed to pass. And um, I went to the University of Texas, the art department. And the principal of my high school, asked me to come and talk to him and he said you will never make it you will never make it through that the early detective it's just too, you just don't have the mental equipment to do it and i wanted to say and later i i wanted to say look let me hear you. there are two departments in a college where people never flunk out from one is home economic and the other is the art department if you just show up you get you bad and also i I began to learn strategy for for learning, and I my dyslexia, once I had glasses, began to sort of go away, and I began to I began to actually learn things instead of guessing at things, and I and and it the it actually was really saved my life. And that's it. By the time I got through, I was con I was con I wasn't the world's smartest person, and everybody knew that within an instant of meeting me, I was still able to get by. And I had also um, I had also when I couldn't read as a young boy. Um, I had an uncle who managed a little nickel and dime movie theater in Dallas, and he would let me in for free in the summers, and I would see every program, every movie that was there, and plus any other movie I could go to, because I could, 
understand movement. It was visual storytelling. You must you must have been sat very close to the screen with your. With your yeah. Well, I didn't realize it. I, I always saw part of perspective. It was that things got fuzzier the farther away they got, and um, the moment I understood that things were in, there was a whole world that opened. It was it was like it was like saw on the road to Damascus. I, it changed my life. And was there was there a movie or movies that uh, that you saw over and over again that were the ones that kind of you said, oh my god I think I, love it. I saw the red shoes maybe forty times I think I saw um, singing in the rain at least fifty times I think I saw um, I, I would I would lock on to movies and 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 it once you see something a certain amount of you begin to see you begin to notice the structure of movies you begin to notice why this thing happened or this thing and and much as i'm looking at at elizabeth taylor and montgomery cliff and and one of the greatest movies that they ever did or that was in the sun right. i began to notice after a while that in the opening scene you see montgomery cliff hitchhiking and a, and a convertible which is my with Elizabeth Taylor in the car in the in the car. And you begin to notice the way he the way George Stevens cut one shot after another shot after another shot. And how it, the rhythm of you begin to notice the rhythm of storytelling. And and it it was um, it was for me learning about something without a teacher but but still with a, that it revealed itself to people i mean movies i i don't know what i would have done with that movie i would have never had to log me up in some place but the movies literally saved my life whether it was Evan costello or whether it was sean luke Godard. it is they have taught me they have taught me more about life than almost anything now, uh, but seeing them, a lot of people would have just seen them and felt them, but you were perceptive enough to actually understand uh, narrative storytelling and how. Well, it, it wasn't that quite, I, I happened to fall in love with certain actors. I, I fell in love with Moira Shiro from the Red Shoes, and I saw her again and again in Vindex. Sooner or later, you begin to notice the scenes in which he's not on camera, and you begin to notice how they make sense. And and in Singing in the Rain, I, I think I memorized that film. You begin to notice it wasn't just Debbie Reynolds and Gene, it was Donald O'Connor who was the linchpin of that movie. Yeah. And Gene Hagen was just, it was just a brilliant of that performance. You can't, you, you, you begin to look you begin to really look at the movie, and not and not glance at it. And every time Gene, every time Gene Hagen spoke, I went, "Oh, please don't talk like that." Oh, but that was she was she should have gotten the goddamn Academy Award for that. It was one of the great performances any actor ever gave, any time, anywhere. And I have been devoted to her ever since. Now, now I I know. Because you talked about a place in the sun, you tell a story about going to see a place in the sun after work, I think, one night in New York City. And when the lights came up, who else was watching the movie with you? I had, I lived in a, in a an apartment in a in a lovely brown nice apartment, which I could which three of us shared the rent and then we could barely afford it. But it happened to be, and that's a great thing about New York, it happened to be across the street from a, a house that was owned by Catherine Hepburn. And and um, and one night I, I was working, I was going to Columbia during the day and then working from five o'clock at night until like nine o'clock at night. And, and a really lousy job from which I got fired. And I 
on my way home, the, this little theater, which played plays in the sun for I don't know how long, but I went to see it because I was just utterly miserable. And I was sitting there watching and I memorized that film. I memorized the shot pattern of the, of the when they start to dance together. I memorized it, that the, 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 the fact that you see Montgomery Cliff and Shelley Winters in a scene in front of the courtroom in which he's going to be tried for her murder. And and I, as the light came up, I looked over and there were like four people in the audience and one of them was Catherine Hepburn. And I thought, this is the city where I need to live, like the, where I can go to the movies and I'm sitting in a movie and there is Catherine Hepburn. And it was... Um, Did you say anything to her? Never. Never. I never. <laughs> no, I understand. I would have stuttered. I would have. I don't know what I would have done. I would have. It was beyond speech at that time. But I understand you also saw her doing something with Spencer Tracy, which not a lot of people had seen. Because I then later um, got a job working, doing paste up in the mechanicals, and I had to leave the apartment early to get to to the the job, I got up one morning and I looked across, I always check out the, a couple, you know, her house across the street and there was a limo and the door opened and she came out in a robe and there was Spencer Tracy and they sat and had that morning talk that people have before they say, I'll see you in a couple of days. And it was, um, again, I thought that this is the place I don't know if it wants me, but I know I want it. Mm. So, so now you you uh, you're st you're studying art, and you get you get a I'm job. Studying art and trying to stay out of the army. Right. Of the draft, and I right. I'm successful in both. And I finally got a job. Before I got drafted, I got a job working as my. my <laughs> My father fed up, was fed up with this, with me being in New York and wanted me to come back to Texas. And he sent my mother and my sister from Texas to New York to come and bring me back. And then, and then two days before they arrived, uh, I got a job as the assistant to the art director of Esquire Magazine, which was one of the best jobs. I've had three great jobs in my life. One was working in a bookstore in Austin, Texas. One was working as the assistant to the art director of Esquire Magazine. And um, and the other was directing. But it it was um, it was I mean I was saved saved by the bell of from from getting dragged, kicking and screaming back to Texas. And um, and by the time I I was in drafted. By the time I came out of the army, I knew how to I knew how to function anywhere. I went back to Esquire and ultimately became the art director. And you ran into and, there was someone else at, at Esquire who ended up becoming your partner, David Newman. Uh, there was a young editor at Esquire. And so he was I, the editor. So, so you were interacting and, with him? Am I when are you doing this? What am I do I need to do something I'm not doing? No, 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 no. You're doing fine. I just okay. want the two of you. We, How did you meet, I guess, is the question. I had done working with a, a, a friend from Texas called Harvey Schmidt, who was one of the composers of the Fantastic. We did a book together called the in and out book. And then, and it was very popular. And then um, Esquire started me doing, besides being art director, it started me doing Articles and things. And David <coughs> arrived as a as an editor there, and they they paired us together, and we got along very well. And we we um we did a whole bunch of small articles together, and and we both loved movies, and it was at the time of the new way. And um, we spent all of our time talking about movies and as everybody did in those days that was you spent more time talking about movies than you spent talking about art and also working at Esquire at that time was Peter McDonovich and we became friendly 
and David and I, I talked David into because I didn't know how to write. I couldn't spell. I couldn't punctuate. I did, I did not know. I knew zero about writing. But I talked. I was good at talking people into things. And I talked. Still to, are, Dave. Still are, Bob. Maybe so. I don't know. <laughs> and, uh, and I talked David into writing a movie together. And at that time, a book by John Toland came out about Bonnie, about Dillinger. But anyway, it was a footnote about Bonnie Parker and Slide Barrel. And uh, my father had known had known of them. They were in Texas and and had um, and knew where they were buried. And so I stole, I, I stole David these stories about that I'd heard from my father about Bonnie and Clyde. And we decided to write a kind of French gangster movie about two American gangsters. And and we um, we didn't know how to write a screenplay, but we wrote a treatment. And we had um, once we'd done it. We had a reading for people, and one of the people at the reading was a woman named Helen Scott, who worked for the French Film Office. And she thought it was good enough that she sent it to Truffaut. And Truffaut wrote us back and said, and sent us some French newspaper cartoons about Bonnie and Clyde, and said he would like to be interested in doing it, and he was coming to New York, and he would, um, he would like to meet. And we were thrilled. So he came to New York. We sat in a, a, a hotel room with Helen Scott acting as translator. And for two days, and there's a scene in the existing Bonnie and Clyde, which was dictated to us by Francois Truffaut. And um, Arthur, uh, I, said, that we, I mean, it's just easily public now. And we did it. We sent it, and Arthur said, and, and I'm sorry, no, and Truffaut said that uh, he had another picture to do first, and he didn't want to commit himself to two pictures in advance. So we went from having something to nothing. So but he said he'd given it to his good friend, Jean-Luc Godard. And so Godard was in New York for the, for the film festival. He met with us. He said, in a typically Godardian way, look, I'm supposed to do a movie called Alpha. Well, I don't want to do it with my ex-wife. I don't want to do it. And, um, but I will do that. I'll come out, I get out of the car, I'll be back, we'll begin to shoot in December. And they did a French film, he knew, that's what he knew how to do. And yeah, this is not, this, this, right now you only have a treatment, right? You have only have a treatment, we don't even have a script. And, and, we know, so we did have a script, but that's when we had our first draft of the script. Okay. And at that, and, and these people didn't want to say, they didn't have the money because that's what, as far as French, as far as the French were concerned, a producer is the guy with the money. And so they said, well, the weather is meant to be shot in the summer. And, they, and Godard stood up and said, I'm talking cinema, you're talking meteorology, and he walked out of the room. So it sat there and I just turned down by every director. To our producer that anyone could think of. And one, I mean, and that we were told how awful it was by maybe 200 people. And we still persisted. And um, what I, in the meantime, I got married and um, we had a son, newborn, and the phone rang one morning and it was Warren Beatty who I met with and knew slightly. And he said, I hear you've got a screenplay called Bonnie and Clyde. I'd like to read it. And I said, fine. I said, it's been, I mean, I knew it had been turned by everybody, but I didn't want to waste my time with Warren. But I said, I'll drop it off at your at your hotel. He said, no, no, I'll come by. And I said, well, he didn't actually, he'll come by at three in the afternoon. Uh, my wife was in blue jeans with no makeup and her hair and rollers. 10 minutes later, the doorbell rang. My wife answered it, thinking it was the super. And there was Warren Beatty in full bloom. 
and I thought she would kill me. I mean, she took me, I handed her the script, and I spent an hour apologizing to my wife. And when, when the phone rang again, and it was Warren, and he said, I, I, I want to do this picture. I said, well, the two producers that are attached to it right now, they'll, their option runs out in December. Uh, he said, I'll wait, I'll wait the option now. I said, but we'd like you, I mean, we, we thought the dart might be interesting to do it. And so there was actually a meeting between the dart and, and Warren Beatty, and I would have given anything to be a fly on the wall in that meeting. Anyway, they didn't, obviously they didn't do it, and Warren started to work on it. And, um, and he, he turned out to be one of the great producers of all time. Without a doubt. Who went to make a movie that wasn't about him? He knew when to take what was best in the movie and 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 follow that lead. And he also knew to get Arthur Penn. And they had done a picture together, which I think it wasn't successful. Mickey won. And he knew that Arthur was right, and he said to me, "I will. I'm going to go find Arthur. I'm going to lock him in a room." until he agrees to do the picture. And the next call I got was from Arthur Penn. And it was the, the working relationship between, between David and me, between, with Arthur and Warren, was extraordinary. It was, it was one of the best times. There, there are people who taught me something about movie that I never would have understood without their presence in my life. One was Warren and Arthur, because I can't separate them. And the other was Altman. Altman really taught me how to direct. He was, uh, and he got, he spent his life so pissed off. I mean, he fired me two or three times in the course of the month, and then he hired me back the next day. And, but he was a genius, and I would, and he made Late Show work. He really did. I mean, he, I can't tell you, I can't say enough about what a genius I thought all my life. And, and, and I've still got the bruises. All right, so let's, let's go back to Bonnie and Clyde for a minute. So Warren, we know the stories of how Warren found the money, and uh, he brought he in... He was every actress in Hollywood. Yes. He, he, yes. <laughs> Yes. Warren, if you're listening, I sent this to him, so he may be on, Bob. I don't know. <laughs> um, any rate, uh, you you make the movie. Are you were you were you and David on the set? Uh, no, all the time? no. But then at a certain point, he brought Town in, and right. Town I think did a really extraordinarily good job of of both developing the, the things that were in the picture and acting as an intermediary between Warren and Arthur. And I think Town has a credit, and he, it's a credit that he really deserves in that picture. Yeah. Okay, so now you've, the, the movie's over. You hear there's an editor named Dee Dee Allen, who I know we all know what Dee Dee did and love Dee Dee. I got to work with her also. But you, you see a first cut of this film. Tell me just blown away by here's two guys who work for a magazine called Esquire you write a, a screenplay about some story about two people nobody other than in Texas and maybe a few French people heard of and all of a sudden you're having you're having meetings with Francois Truffaut Jean-Luc Godard Warren Beatty and you make a movie and now you see what I guess was the director's cut tell me you're sitting in a room what did you think I thought it, it was better than I expected it to be. I thought Arthur, Arthur was a genius in that. He's a genius, in, but he was a genius in that picture. And I think his use, his use of what we had done, patched together with what, what, um, with town, and and was was extraordinarily good. I mean, I think, I I think. Arthur Penn was a great director, but that was a that was a um, that was a collaboration 
between two people who were, who, who, it, it's just a perfect fit. And it wasn't that anything, there was nothing ahead of them that would have made you think it might have worked. And yet they, it was absolutely perfect. Sometimes and, and you Dee Allen was a big major part of that. The importance of that picture is, is editing is a kind of writing and 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 it's a and editors don't often get credit for the 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 what they bring to a picture. They think they just cut it together and it's fast, it's slow. But this Bonnie and Clyde was about style and Dee Dee Allen was a major part of that style. I'm, I'm so glad you said that because my grandson, who I hope is listening, is an assistant editor in the business. Oh. And he loves editing, so I, yeah. I love that you said that. But it that. is a form of writing, and it's a great thing to do. Yeah, so, so now um, the movie, we all know the story of how nobody wanted to play it, and Warren pushed it, and all the stuff, and it becomes this huge hit I'm sure every agent in town is all over you. And uh, I think, I, 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 as I recall, you went with Robbie Lance, I think was, or was it Sam? It was the one named Gloria Sapphire. Oh, Gloria, but then you- New York agent named the Gloria. Right. And, and, and I think, I think <coughs> you broke the man with Joe Mankiewicz, but the movie takes off and all of a sudden the Oscar nominations come out and you're nominated. Here's a guy who a few years ago was at working as an assistant art director at Esquire. Well, I was the art director. By then, I was the art director. Oh, I'm, they I'm they getting... killed away, and I was left holding the bag. Okay, and you're nominated for an Oscar, and you go to the Academy Awards in 1968, I guess. And what is it like? You're sitting there, and so, you're up against, you know, in the heat of the night, and uh, guess who's coming? The graduate. Hmm? And guess who's coming to dinner? The heat of the night, the graduate. Yeah. Um, well, it was that thing that all your friends tell you you're going to win. You're going to win. You're going to win. It's, it's got to be you. You got to win. And and we believe that. Oh, and on. so they the time came and we're sitting. Um, we're sitting in this auditorium. It was it was a temporary location for the Academy Awards, and and they said, and now the, the winner for the best original screenplay is, and they tore open the envelope, and I stood up. And one person, a big flat arena. I stood up because I sure I was sure my friends were right, and they said, I think it was William Rose for Guess Who's Coming for Dinner. I think it was. Yes, it was. Of a bitch. And 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 they said, "Well, you're, I sat down. So I had a bruise on my backside for six months." <laughs> Jeez. Okay. All right. Now you 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 do another movie. You write another movie. There was a crooked man. You and David are, are writing screenplays, and David says to you, "You know, I think I want to be a director." And now you're in a dilemma because. You don't want to be a producer. You want to be a writer. But if he's going to direct, you know. I didn't even want to be a writer. I wanted to be a co-writer. I didn't think I could handle being a writer, okay? <laughs> and, and when they, I remember we were on a plane coming back from, um, from the set. And David said, I, I think I, I want to direct. I think I should direct. And um, I thought, there goes the partnership. Because you can't have a partnership in which if one person directs, there's a, there's a year in which he has to cast, shoot, cut the picture. So that, that's, and I thought, what am, I can't, you know, nobody's going to hire me or what am, what's going to happen? So I said, thinking I could buy myself some time. I'd say, okay, if you want to direct, I want to direct. I didn't want to direct. Believe me, I did not want to direct. I knew I wasn't capable of it. it zero. And David didn't care. So we did fine. So we did two screenplays. Uh, 
one that David was to direct and one that I was to direct. And the one that I was to direct was Bad Company, which is where I was. Which I was lucky enough to be your first AD on, yes. One of the, let me say this to everybody. One of the best times I've had in 200 years of filmmaking was driving across country with Hulk. I introduced him to fried egg sandwiches, which I think he never expected to have in his entire life. And, <laughs> and, and I showed him my hometown. Winston's Burgers in Kansas City. Yes, oh, well, those were great. But but we had, um, I had one of the best times I've had in all, all of movie making history. But we, and I, but it, we we found this. You found this location in in Can in Kansas in the Flint Hills of Kansas, and um, we started casting. And um, and Stanley Jaffe, who was the producer, who was why he didn't shoot me, I don't know, but he did, and. Um, he found, uh, I had, that I was deeply enamored of uh, Ride the High Country. I wanted the cinematographer to ride the high country. And I even met with him. And he's a very nice man. And he goes, I, I think there's one, I'd like to see one. Okay. He's doing a movie for Paramount right now, but I can get with some daily food to look. I said, well, I don't want to be rude. Look, okay. And if he showed me a scene from Godfather 3 to where he wrote it from. And I, by the 10 seconds into it, I knew this was one of the great cinematographers of all time. And I said, I began, no, it's not. He was the same. And Gordy also was one of those people who taught me about, about filmmaking. He said, you're going to get in the middle of this picture and you're going to be too busy to worry about shot or this shot or that close up or this whatever it is but i'll remember and i'll hold you to it and we spent we spent every afternoon and evening after after working of, on the set on the pre-production just sitting and going through the script and figuring out how to shoot it and he said i said i think this is good this is good and he said yeah, but you, you're, what you set up is not, this doesn't follow it. You have to make images that follow images. And he was and, and a great cinematographer, whether it's Gordy or Michael Chapman or, or Nestro Mendros or Shani Escoffier, they, they, they understand that this is a form of writing. And, and in a way, this is where being our director of Esquire was really an enormous help to me. It, 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 first of all, it taught me to listen to somebody who's smarter than me. And there are millions of those people now. And it was, it, I knew by the time we started work, he had given me a structure that I had participated in, but it was, it was a structure we made together. And we were we were doing a scout with who, the man who was the first production designer. And 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 we, on the scout, I kept getting so different. And I didn't know why, but I was thinking, this isn't right, this doesn't, I don't, something's a matter, and I don't have the words for it, but I, I don't know how to change it. And about halfway through, the day, Gordy came to me and said, "Look, I know, I know you're upset. I can feel that. But we haven't said anything." He said, "I can tell you what the problem is. You wanted a movie that took place in, in an endlessly flat prairie that was always the same. He gave you locations that were always varied and different, and he destroyed the very thing you wanted unintentionally." And, and and then 
who let this man go and hired Paul Silver, who understood exactly what we wanted and was brilliant as a production designer. And I mean, Stanley was patient. Why he didn't shoot me, I don't know. But he was incredibly patient. And um, it was. There, there's a great. When I realized that making movies is it's not writing and it's not painting, and it, but it's something. It's about discovery in a way. It's about discovering something, making something as it's in production, as you're working. It's not. It's not allowing things to happen and knowing when they're right and knowing when they're not right. I mean, they're, they're, I knew nothing, nothing. And what Gordy did and what you did and what Stanley did, they just you, you carried me along until I was able to sort of crawl by myself. There's a, there's a great story that both Dick and Paul Silbert did always, and I'll, I'll never forget this. We got out of the car with Paul and you got out of the car looking around as to where you wanted to shoot. And Paul went somewhere and stood. And you kept walking around and finally you came to where Paul was standing and said, oh, this is a good spot to shoot. <laughs> Absolutely right. Absolutely true. You remember? Yeah, <laughs> of course. Yeah. Paul <laughs> was great. And so was Anthea. Uh, Anthea. Ah, miss her. She's in Greece somewhere. Yeah. So, so, uh, but originally, I just want to go back because there's one great story that you tell is that, you know, all of a sudden you're going to direct and you didn't want to direct, but you're going to do a screen test with an actor and you had a friend, Bud Yorkin, and you knew Yorkin and yeah. Lear. Okay. And, and Yorkin kind of talked to you and what happened? How did you fall in love with directing? When... When, as it, I was to do a test to see if I could direct. I knew I couldn't direct, but I was, had to go through the charade of doing a test. And I, and I didn't want to make an utter fool of myself. And, the, and I, we had done a picture that had never gotten made for York and Lear and really working with, with Bud. And I'd gotten along with Bud very well. And I called him and said, listen, I'm in real trouble. I'm supposed to do this test. Now. I don't know what I'm doing. He said, don't worry, come out here, meet with me, we'll run, we'll send me the script. And and we went through the script and he said, you do this scene and you do this scene. And here's why you do these two scenes. One shows you can move a camera and one shows you can do a scene where the camera is absolutely static. And and here's where you said, here's on the, on the, on the, uh, on the scene that's the long tracking shot. You, you let them walk in the frame and then you let them walk out of frame at the end. You don't try to follow them beyond a certain point. And then, and you, and, and you don't put them so far away that you can't see them, but you don't put them so close you can't see anything else but them. And, and also in the, in the static shot, um, you give the actors room, just listen to them. Don't, Tell, don't spend your time telling them what to do. Just, just listen to them. They're, they're going to be good actors. They're going to know what to do. <coughs> and he got me through. But we did the, we did uh, two two scenes that were supposed to take a day. We did it. We were finished by two in the afternoon. Stanley fell in love with me that day. <laughs> yeah, but what it, did you did you fall in love with directing? And I fell in love with directing. Suddenly, I, it wasn't it, it. Directing wasn't telling people what to do. Directing was listening to people, whether it's the cameraman or the editor or the AD or or, or the actor. It's listening to people, paying attention to people. Wow. Now, Stanley. Now, now you had a choice to make as a director, because, as you know, I've worked with many A and B directors. There are two kinds of... I chose this 
second one because I didn't know what it is. But, um, but it was it, uh, money was at one time incredibly hard because the weather got cold. And I'm not sure I'm supposed to tell this story, but I'm telling the story that we would finish shooting the day. And Gordy and God bless him, Michael Chapman. Chappy was the operator for those who don't know. He was the operator. Right. And you drove, as I recall. Probably. And I sat next to you. And somebody where along the way had a bottle of wild turkey. Probably we didn't, going out. we didn't use it going out, but coming home, we passed that bottle around. It was the it was I thought, okay, if this people that you love drinking I'm for it, sign me up. <laughs> wow. Um, all right, so I won't go through any more of that movie because I I got a lot of other movies to talk about. But uh and but speaking of movies, you've made a there was a quote that I had never heard before that I, I know you've quoted before. And for all of our residents at the Motion Picture Home and, and the people in the industry who are listening to this, it's one of my favorite statements. It was from Mr. Fellini, who said, every, sa every soundstage in every corner of the world smells the same. Absolutely right. It's exactly true. And I was in Moscow pretending to be looking at Moss film for something. Jack Valeni had allowed me to go. And I was doing Gorky Park, and Paul Silbert was sitting in Helsinki waiting for my photographs to take because I, I was the only one allowed in. And I went to Moss film, and sure enough, I walked on a soundstage, and without knowledge of anything of what everybody was doing, what the director was wearing, the script supervisor, the wardrobe lady, everybody was exactly yes. the same. Yes, yes. <laughs> so now we'll skip a little bit, not much, but you worked with, you knew Peter Bogdanovich at, at, uh, at Esquire. Knew. And now comes one of my, uh, I think it's a perfect comedy actually. And you got to work with my pal Buck. Uh, What's up, Doc? How did that happen? Okay, l let me let me say a little bit about about Bob Town and Buck Henry and um, Tom Mankiewicz. People used to think if you're a writer and and somebody comes in and does the finish that is something shameful. And in fact, the closest analogy to, to movies is baseball. Nobody expects a pitcher to do a full nine innings. Sometimes they do it and it's a miracle, but the win is a win, whoever gets the win, and that's all that matters. And Buck Henry's work in, in, in What's Up Doc it is breathtaking. And I think lifted it up more than several notches. In, in Superman, I was only on it for the first draft in the polish, and then I would off to do it. And, um, but I know that the funniest line in that movie is when Lois Lane is falling off the Empire State Building and Superman grabs her. It's the first time that we've seen him. And he says, don't worry, I've got you. And she said, I know you've got me, but who's got you? That is not a line I wrote. I can tell you this one. I, my guess is it's Tom Mankiewicz. It has a Tom Mankiewicz sound to it. But it doesn't matter. What matters is the director and the producer were smart enough to say, we need something. We need a closer. We need somebody to, to, to bring the... the Finish it with wit and style, and and I think Buck Henry was brilliant about that, and so was Tom Mankiewicz. Well, but and so and then, and earlier was was uh, was Town. Well, but did, what's up, Doc? Was it something that you guys came up with, or where did it come from? It, it 
Peter called us and said, I want to do a remake of Bringing Up Baby. And I want it to be with Ryan O'Neill and, um, and, and uh, Shrike. And we said, okay. And we went out and we screamed, they, Peter screamed, Barbara's house. Peter screamed, bring up baby. And they said, well, Ryan said, well, you've got a much better part than I have, which is true. And she said, oh no, you've got a you've got a much better part than I have. And and Peter somehow he would send them pages. And he said at one point, Ryan O'Neill read the pages I sent him and threw them to the bottom of the swimming pool. Now that's hardly encouraging. I kept saying to him, this picture is not going to get made. We're going to get that. I was going off, uh, I was going off to do. Actually, I was going off to, to do um, bad company. And um, that, what pulled it together was Peter's sheer determination and, and I think Buck Henry's genius. Because there's, there's, there's structure to comedy, which I don't fully, that don't begin to understand. I'm the wrong person to, to, to ask to do a comedy because I'm just not good at it. And, and Peter was smart enough to know he needed someone like Buck Henry in there. And Buck Henry did this thing. And I think, I think, sorry, I think David did a, 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 a fabulous job, but I think that, um, that the, the that thing, Peter knew when to, to bring just the right person into that project. Yeah, well, I got to work with Buck on Heaven Can Wait with Warren again, yeah. and uh, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. He, he added that that he, extra spice that. Yeah, he, had, he, he, he was like the perfect closer. Yeah, yeah. So now, I, again, because we're, we're not gonna have enough time to talk about everything, in your life, but I know that you do the Late Show, and you talked about Altman and how he you helped. You want to talk about me being in the Cub Scout? Yeah. No, <laughs> that's a big part. <laughs> and again, you're nominated. I love the Cub. Yes. <laughs> I. I so what are we talking about now? I don't think we can talk about the Cub Scouts anymore. Uh, no, we shouldn't. We shouldn't. That was a, that really getting kicked out of the Cub Scouts was not a high point of my life. And again, you're nominated for The Late Show. And again, yes. you go to the Oscars. Now, are your friends still telling you you're going to win? No, no, believe me. No, nobody actually, with them, when I saw that I'd been nominated, I thought, who paid off who? I mean, you know, I mean, I was thrilled that, 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 that I had gotten, and I didn't expect to win. We were sitting in between, um, we're sitting in between a writer who won. Notice I don't remember writer's name. Uh, I'm sitting between the writer who won for the Jane Fonda movie and the writer who and Alvin Sargent. Alvin, Alvin, Alvin Sargent. Alvin Sargent and the guy who won for for Annie Hall. For Annie Hall, I think his name's Woody something. It's Woody's co-writer on that, but he was sitting oh, there. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'll yeah. Be. Um, and that was the best time I ever had because I knew I wasn't going to win. I just had a great time. Okay, so now we have to get to uh, your most famous, successful, and double Academy Award-winning picture, Kramer versus Kramer. You've worked with Stanley before, and I've watched Stanley go crazy on the set, and he was... Stanley also is a great producer, no doubt about it. And actually, Stanley was on this program a few weeks ago. Uh, but I understand that you you knew about Kramer, but now Sam Cohn and I guess Arlene Donovan is, are there, and you're trying to get the job, right? Uh, no, what happened is this. They, I'm wrong. They asked me to do it, and I said, no, I, I thought... They, well, they should really give it to. I'd be glad to write it. 
they should give it to Truffaut, who had done a wonderful movie called Pocket Change. And, uh, and I thought he'd be great because he understood children. And Truffaut said, I'd like to do it, but I have another picture to do first. Same thing he said on Bonnie and Chloe. And uh, some people never learn. And, and he, um, and he said, I, I, I'll do it after this. And Stanley didn't want to wait. And in the meantime, I turned in a screenplay for a movie. And, and Sam and Arlene called me and said, this is a terrible script. This is just a terrible script. And I thought, wait a minute, what am, I'm gonna, I've got to go to work. And, and, and they said, well, I, this, this is not workable script. And they said, I think maybe we can get Kramer for you. I said, don't please do it. Because I needed to go to work. I, had, I flat out run out of money. And, and so we were in Germany doing publicity on the late show. Sam called and said, okay, you're, he, Stanley says, it's okay for you. It's good for you to do it, okay? He wants you to come back and go straight to California and start to work. And that working process with Stanley was great. And he was the perfect producer. For it because he, he had a family. He loved his family. And he knew what happens when a family gets fractured. And, and he also, he, we trusted one another. When Stanley doesn't like something, I trust him that he's right about that. And, and it's hard for me to say anybody else is right with that, right? but I trust Stanley and all of them. I want you to know, Stanley, I do know is watching. So you can say hi to Stanley. But I, do, I trust him totally when I don't trust, there's always nobody else I trust. I mean, he's, he's, he's a, he is as brilliant a producer as I have ever worked with or ever expect to work with in my lifetime. Okay, so now you... And they do, Stanley, if you are listening, remember you do only $15. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't know anything about comedy. Tell me, <laughs> what, I mean, there's lots of great stuff in... I mean, I could go on and on about Kramer, and I've seen Kramer probably as many times as, as you've seen uh, Singing in the Rain. But um, tell me about working with young, with Justin Henry, the young boy, and how, you, how you're able to get the... the I mean, I, I, I've looked at it enough times to know when you cut away from him and when you came back and got up, but what about the, the fall and the crying uh, after the fall in the jungle gym. I mean, what, what do you say to him? How do you get that, that emotion out? Sometimes, I mean, we, to cast that way, we had like 300 children we saw. And, and, and we kept narrowing the group. And, and Justin kept staying in it, but he was never our first choice because he was too pretty. And, 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 but he, we couldn't, because he was good, he, we couldn't throw him out. And, and finally, it got down to four or five. And I had my favorite. Dustin certainly had his favorite. Stanley had his favorite. None of them were Justin. And I said, okay, here's what we're gonna do. The screen test was done with Dustin. And Dustin, I said, he's gonna, he's gonna do what he does and actually work and process it. He's gonna improvise. And the and the actor, the child actor has to be able to keep up with. It. And some of them were defeated from the start. And some of them were just acting. But but Justin Henry stood up to Dustin and went toe to toe with Dustin and fell into the character instantly. Absolutely instantly, and and he was perfect, and it was galling for all of us to sit there and say to one another at lunch that day, he is the perfect person. Well, maybe anyway, he is the perfect person, and he was. There was no, there was almost no. There is one notable scene that was 
that was directed by Dustin. And it is where, and he said it was half an hour with his daughter and, and adapted for this. And, and it's the ice cream scene. And it was, I said, I can't, he said, just let us show it to you. Just don't say no. That's Dustin's first words are always, don't say no. And it was brilliant. And I, I'd have to be incredibly stupid not to have said yes to that. But I also, to go back, to Justin, he should have gotten a goddamn Academy Award because he he helped. He's the glue of that movie. He yeah. is the thing that makes everything believable in that movie. He is for as great as Meryl is, for as great as Dustin is, is for as great as Jane Alexander. He is the rock of that movie, yeah. and I hardly said a word of direction. He just understood it and did it. So I'm not going to go through how huge a hit it was and how many critics and awards you got, but now we're going back to the Oscars now for the third time, and uh, you're sitting there with Sally and Stanley and everybody, and uh, it, you know I th I don't remember whether Nestor won or was nominated. Oh, no, Nestor didn't. It, was, it wasn't even nominated. Wasn't nominated. Well, all right. But now it gets to original screenplay, adapted screenplay, sorry, and you win. Now, were you afraid to stand up or what happened? How did you feel? I sat there. I didn't move. I turned to Sally and I said, what did he say? And Sally said, you won. And then I got up. <laughs> and then you, come, you go into the press in the back. You have to come back around. You were there. Huh? I know I was there. And by the way, a little bit of trivia. Do you know who the producer of that Oscar show was? Was it you? No, my father. Oh, okay. Okay. But I was backstage. Yes, I was backstage. But but you have to come back and sit in your chair again. And best director is... <laughs> and now what happens? <laughs> and then I get up and I do the song and dance again. And I, I, there's a part where you think, this is, this is so good, it will never happen to me again. I, I can't hold on to it too tightly. I have to let it go. Mm. And then it wins Best Picture. And it wins Best Picture. And, and Meryl wins, and Dustin wins. Yeah. Uh, did you now? Did you go to the governor's ball, or did all of you? Yes, I think we went to somewhere. Sally tells the story that I'm notoriously I can't dance. I have no sense of rhythm. I can't dance, but I asked her to dance, and we started to dance, and we were dancing. And she said, "You, you win an Academy Award, and suddenly you can dance." And I said, "Two Academy." Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Now, unbelievable. Uh, now, you, you made a statement that I love. I want to, I have to read it. If you want to do some project really, really badly, they never let you. If you don't give a shit about a project, they'll throw it at you and plead with you to do it. That's true. Right? Isn't that what you said that, right? Yeah. Now, how does that tie into... Places in the heart. It was turned down. I had the head of the studio that was in his office with me and with Arlene, the producer, and said, This is the worst script. And you don't know any book that you're talking about. It, we, for an hour, he savaged. This, this is the head of TriStar? No, this is before Tri the TriStar ah. saved our necks. This is right. in Columbia. All right. I remember. Okay, I won't mention a name. I won't mention the name either. But it was, there are murders that have been less painful. And we, Arlene and I walked out and talked. Why? Did he, he couldn't he have just said no? And he, he just, it, somehow it drove him crazy. 
And I thought, well, this is not going to be as easy as I thought. And and it wasn't. It got turned down by every, people who said to me, I don't, I don't have to read the script. Whatever you want to do, I'll do it. And then they said, well, actually, I read the script, and this isn't for us. And it was finally, and I was ready to give up on it. And finally, um, Sam Khan said, let me try one more place. Try, there's a new studio, TriStar, and Sidney Pollock and David Spiegel are, are running. And, and I think they might go for this. And they did. And, and they were great. They were perfect producers. And I'm, but God do I owe them a lot. Wow. Well, David has remained one of my best friends. Bob. David, I just got a call from David the other day. I haven't had a chance to answer it yet. So listen, we, we have a special surprise. Freda, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, Jennifer, I just got word that Stanley Jaffe, we've never done this before, wants to say hi. Oh, uh, Jennifer, can you do this? We've never brought somebody else in. This is very exciting for me. You guys were my my first producer and director as, my, as a first AD. Wow. You've got me through it. <laughs> the two of you. Stanley, hey, man. Hey. There, where's Stanley? Hit video. Where is Stanley? That's not Stanley. That's me. That's you. I don't see Stanley. I don't see Stanley, Jennifer. There he, there he is, Stanley. Hi, Stanley. How great to see you, Stanley. It, it, You're muted, Stanley. Hit unmute. He's not muted. We can't you, hear you. Can I hear you, Stanley? Do we have sound? His microphone may not be working. But I think on his... Computer, he's I don't mind that you still owe me fifteen dollars. Now we can't hear you. All I can say is, for those of you who out there, we have. This is one of the greatest producers who ever lived, from forty years ago, and they're still with us and and loving movies, and and supporting our business. Stanley, I don't know why we can't talk to you. We, we can't hear you. It's in his computer system. I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do from this side. Okay. Uh, it's very dangerous liaisons. It's beyond my control. All right, it's Stanley. You're going to have to call. You're going to have to call Benton later, and I'm going to put a Zoom together so I can be there and hear you guys talk. Great. All right. Thank you. All right. Sorry, Stan. All right. So we're going to go back now and. You're now at the Academy for the fourth time. You and Sally are sitting there, and Sally is saying, you know, do we have to do this? Yeah. And did you think... I don't think she was doing that. What, what do you think? Okay, what, what were you thinking this time? Places in the heart. I was thinking that it... Um, I was thinking that I was proud of the picture. I was proud of the work the actors had done, and that and that Carol Littleton had done, and that that everyone had done in some ways to do a movie about your home is is both the hardest and the most delightful thing to do, and um and and to. To receive an award for that is it, it meant more than almost any other award meant because it was saying how much I owed all those people. Well, let's talk about those people and let's start with your mom and dad. Yes. Um, tell me about your relationship with your father. With my father? Yeah. <laughs> my father was great. And when I wasn't scared to death of him, he was phenomenal. I mean, my father, first of all, my father, 
and I went to movies together all the time. My father had a ferocious temper, and I've seen him in, in tough circumstances. And but he was I was his closest friend, and he was in some real sense my closest friend. Um I think when I made the decision to leave not simply walk out to the Texas, I think it broke his heart and I think he was just about angry at me that, that I would leave him. We had relatively few friends and I was one of the that he had. And and um but he got me through a lot. Because of him, I got to go to a, a, an extremely good art school in high when I was in high school. And he got because of him. And he didn't want me to do it, but he did it because of me. And and um and, and life was hard for him. And I suppose in a way, I'll spend my life writing about him in one way or the other. And your mom? And my mother has been in, she must be, places is all about my mother. It's all about those kind of strength. That, that peculiar strength that women have that men don't possess. That, that, um, that and I admire and help. Did, did Sally know? Sally Field, who won an Oscar, by the way. You won screenplay and she won the Oscar mm -hmm. for acting. Did Sally and you have conversations about your mother? She, I didn't have to. Sally, when Sally, we were in the final rehearsal before we started work, we were rehearsing on the set, and Sally walked in, and she was wearing a perfume that my grandmother wore without me ever saying one word to her. About wow! And she and I was just stunned. I didn't. I just suddenly, it was that my grandmother's presence suddenly filled that house. And that um, she, I love Sally. I wouldn't say anything to her because I would be tampering with somebody who knew what they were doing and and did it brilliantly without without showing the least sign of effort. And yet it was perfect. She was she's one of the few perfect actors. John Malik is one of the few perfect actors. And so that was one of the great cast I've ever been lucky enough to work with. From the two kids to, to, to all the way through. And it was effortless to do. It was really effortless. We went, I mean, I, I, there were days that were hard, but they were not, they were physically hard. They weren't hard because of disagreements. They weren't hard because of disappointments. It was, there was nothing. That, that ever needed to be reshot. There were a couple of things that I had to do, pick up shots that I did, but nothing that involved a performance. I can't tell you what a gift that cash was to me. Okay, so it, now I have to move. It made me understand more than ever that movies are really about the actors. The director just urged people around. The actors do the heavy lifting. Well, let's let's say the movies that you and I love, that's what the director is. There are other movies that directors have a much bigger part of where unfortunately or fortunately or unfortunately, these big movies on these huge camp uh, canvases today are different than what you and I it's another world. Yeah, another world. 
Um, so let me ask you a question. Did you grow out of the dyslexia? Because I'm trying to understand how someone who can barely get out of school can win two Oscars <laughs> for writing a screenplay and be nominated three more times for a screenplay and continually says, you know, I can't write. Because <clears throat> there are people who can come along and, and make what I write a little more, leg a lot more legible. Got it. Okay. And they're, they, they're like translators and, and they're very, I mean, I've been very lucky to have worked a long time with Arlene Donovan, who really promised, I promise you, she turns what I write into passable English. She's a, she's a great partner. She was a great partner. You talk about your tenants, Bob, trust, faith, empathy, and pragmatism. Can you give a little bit of where that comes from, family trust? <laughs> I think somewhere, I don't know when it was in my life, but I came aware that I was religious and that I returned to the church. I, I'm not going to the church these days because it's uh, difficult to walk and because the churches are mostly closed or down and, and, and not easy for me to get to. But I am, um, but whether I'm a good Christian or not, uh, I am, I, I spend my life struggling with those issues. I, 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 it's hard to talk about religion. With that, and so you sound sanctimonious and you sound self congratulatory, and it's not that, it's not that at all. It's that it is I can't put it into words. Okay, well then let's move on. Tell me, and I know this is a subject that I love as well. A young writer, a young director, or someone who says they want to be a writer, or director, what do you say to them today, given kind of the state of our business and how, how do you get, how do you write, how do you direct in today's world? I don't know. I think this is a different world than the world that I may really have. Um, I think there are a few directors working now that I think are admirable. Being writer directors, and um, and I, I think the I think I think all all you can do is you can't think your way through a movie. You you, you have to. I have done that and I've tried it and I've failed miserably. But when you have to be patient and and you have to know when you're doing, doing something that is that you Can work with. I don't mean be a successful movie. I think there are movies I've done that were not successful that I felt were very good, and movies that were successful that I felt were dumb as a post. Um, I, I think you write remembering that an actor has to believe the words, and, and you can't command an actor to believe something. You have to, you have to meet them halfway or sometimes more than halfway. And you have to, you have to care, you don't have to like the people you like, but you have to care for them. And you have to feel like you understand them. And that they are people whom you feel 
Well, that's the empathy that you have. I, de I don't know what it is. I don't know. You know, I, I, most of my life, I've stumbled into things. I haven't had some kind of plan. I've just, I've been incredibly lucky. And, and I, that's not, I'm, I'm lucky that I met Stanley Jaffe. I'm lucky that I met you. I'm lucky that I married and had a child, the child that, that we have. I am lucky that I've done the movies that I've done that are failures were failures that didn't destroy me, although you tried to. I don't know. I, I've been I've been I've been very fortunate. And and how do you say I've been fortunate? It's not most of it's not been due to me. It's been due to Stanley or to you or to Arlene or to Sam Cohn or to Gloria. So it's, it just it is somehow you get fortunate in your life if you're lucky. Yeah, I I I, I think you have to. As Gordy used to say, Gordon Willis, you know, uh, yes, it can something ha can happen that's lucky, but if you worked hard and prepared correctly, then when the luck comes, you know how to grab it and go with yeah, it. I believe that. You know, I believe that. And much as I love working with Nestor, and I love Nestor, I love working with. Oh yes, go ahead. It was. What I gave up in not working with Gordy was great because Gordy was as great a cinematographer in his way as Nestor was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think by then, I mean, I don't know. I got to work with Gordy three or four more times right after that. Uh, and I know you went, you worked with Nestor. Um, I think one of the, I, I just, I, I really loved Gordy. I, I, he was great. He taught me so much. So we've only I got really a really love Chapman. Chapman was a dear friend of mine, and and I miss him very much. Yeah, me too. So Bob Beecher, our CEO, Jennifer. I think we've only got a couple of a few minutes left. I think they'd like to either ask a question or make a statement, Mr. Beecher. <laughs> Bob is our CEO who the other night, I don't know if you watched the Oscars, but the other night was the, the man who uh, accepted our Oscar, the Motion Picture and Television Fund, was bestowed the Gene Herschel Award. Yeah, that's always what I wanted, and they never gave it to me. <laughs> I wanted the Gene. Peter Bogdanovich once said I was the only person in Hollywood whose ambition was to win the Gene Herschel Award. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll tell you what. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the one we have, if I could have the uh, best director. Um, <laughs> I want that, but I don't want it that much. I, right. I think you've got a campus full of people that will riot uh, if you switch uh -oh. that Oscar. Okay. Oh, I said that on camera, didn't I? You did. Right. Yes, the... We'll talk later. All right. I, I don't have a question for you. Uh, I just yeah. have a, a statement to make, and I feel like I should be doing it on my knees and, and bowing because that, what an incredible career, what an incredible human being you are. I, I so appreciate your sharing all this with us, your kind of insights into yourself and your humility and the cred, you know, crediting you Okay, okay, I'll pay the money I, I owe you. I'll yeah, pay yeah. the money I owe you. <laughs> I mean, my God, you're the first person on the show that's even said something nice about Hawk. For, for... <laughs> <laughs> the what? <laughs> ah, ah, ah. <laughs> Jen, do you have your favorite question? I've got my two favorite questions. Um, so, Mr. Benton, these are very hard questions. I apologize in advance. Um, since the pandemic, and we've been doing this live show to keep the residents socially connected while staying healthy and physically distanced, we've been asking the guests that come on what their favorite movie is and what their favorite TV series is. We're compiling our uh, must-see list.
You still with us? My favorite, my favorite movie. Yes. Pretty hard. I'd say. Gonna be French. It was, I was just about to say The Wild Child. Oh. Or I believe that we've had that on the list already. The Wild Child's been named on the, really? the must-see list, yeah. Um, there is a film that I just pulled up. I, I will have to send you the name. It's, it's, a, it's a French film made in Paris during the war, and it's about, it's with Barol, and it is um, it is about a mime who becomes a major star. I knew. I will get that. The other movie I would say that I would put in that list is Rules of the Game by Renoir. Mm. Rules yeah. of the Game. And a TV series? The game is probably the most perfect movie ever made. Wow. That, that's bold. And the, TV, the TV series, do you have a series that you used to watch? <laughs> Not all in the family? I, I, I find all of them. I love I, <coughs> that. Anyway. So <coughs> I, I, have, I have one last question, Bob. Um, <coughs> When you were a kid watching uh, uh, Debbie Reynolds and Gene Kelly and, and... I was already in middle age at that time. Give me a break. <laughs> so what is it when I was in middle were you, age? Okay, I was when watching... you were with your dad in the movie theater and there was dancing and singing, you couldn't dance. We know you couldn't dance at that point, not until you won an Oscar. But... Did you get up? Did you want to sing those songs? I never kidded myself that much. I did say this. My father and I would go to the movies once or twice a week, two or three times a week. And, and he had relatively few friends. And and I, <clears throat> so did I. And we would, we would not talk, but we would go to the movies. And I remember, I think I was a senior in high school. And I saw a film by John Houston called Asphalt Chronicle. And the beginning of Asphalt Chronicle is, is a neorealist first five minutes. And it's because Houston had been making those documentaries with, with Derby Light and Anzio. And, and then it becomes a regular sort of gangster John Houston expressionistic movie. But I had never seen anything like those first five minutes of, of Asphalt Trump. And when the movie was over, my father got up to leave. And I said, I'm going to watch it again. The first movie I watched back to back again because I couldn't believe it. There was some secret in that movie. And I didn't know what the secret was, and maybe I've never figured it out. But that first five minutes, it, it, it changed my life. And that's what movies can do, that it, at, at some moment, when Donald Khan and Debbie Reynolds and Gene Kelly do Good Morning, it changed my life. When, uh, when Truffaut, and in the, when you're watching that young boy come back from, from running away and knows, and we know the cost that that young, that it, that young boy is paying to come back, to, to, that he, the cost he pays for love is huge. And I think I've never seen that before. I've never known that. It's what I loved in movies is they taught me things that I didn't know that people never talked about. Bob, I have to tell you that 
I've been doing this now for about six, seven, eight months. I don't know. I've never had an experience like this last hour and a half. And thank you. I am. Thank you both. Thank you all. I've had a lovely time. Obviously, it's very, very hard to shut me up. Uh, thank you again very much. I'm just so honored that, that you said yes. And we'll talk about my sister and Merle and everything on another okay. time. But, okay. but love I you. I love do. this panel. Thank you. I'm, I'm deeply grateful. I'm so sorry, Robert. I've got one more really pressing question. Sure. For the fried egg sandwich, is that on toast or not no, toasted bread? No, that's not on Wiggy, that's barbaric. Well, I, I agree, that's but some people do it the wrong guys. way. A fried egg sandwich on a piece of, of white bread, not good white bread. Not whole, it's there, it's with mayonnaise or miracle, better with miracle, miracle whip. Miracle whip, better with miracle whip, and, I agree. Okay. Yes. And, uh, you know, but yeah, it's, 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 a very, it's, it's a delicate balance. People don't realize that. All right, thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Uh, you. We've got some messages up next, and then at one o'clock, we've got uh, Candy Clark. We're going to talk to Candy Clark, and later today, a new original foodie with Alan Miller and Laura Zucker. See you in a minute. <laughs>